wasn't. That's perfect. Okay, I say welcome back to one or two. Um, so the very first, uh, the upper right box of your continuous variable profile is unit of analysis. And so we, we're grounding ourselves in what it is that we're studying. So we are, our unit is a student. Um, and really it's our, it's a, it's a student um, survey, uh, student survey response that represents, it's like a, it's our, it's our attempt to make a material representation of our unit of analysis and that's the student and their perspectives on two questions. So unit of analysis is our student and so we would say that for any given unit of analysis we define a set of variables. So from the programming world the, the crossover works nicely and in, in class design world we would say what are the member variables on our object student and what are the types that go with that so in our case we have each one of you we will be working with two variables and their types are our um our slicer question what what type of data does our slicer question yield so in other words, what we are doing is for every student, we are using a survey question written in the form to write a value to the two variables that we are storing about each student. So the first is the categorical or slicer question. Let's take a look at some of those that we got up there. And um, my review from what we did earlier last week was that we're going to have some interesting stuff to look at, um, which is great. Strip surveys. I'm going to pull up one from last year. So would you vote? Oh, that's too political. I'm going to You're not sharing your screen. Uh, that's okay. Thank you. Um, How would you rate your sleep scale? So do you have a cable subscription was a question that was asked and someone was investigating people's relation. Where do the people get their news? So we would say in this case, do you have a cable subscription? We would be defining a Boolean type variable Boolean. We might name it something like has cable subscription. And so our, our slicer question, the slicer question was allowing us to gather, we would say, Boolean or categorical data about our subject, our student. And then this first inspection question is rate the importance of local, of following local news. Uh, and so the reason we were doing our measurement is because we didn't want the other variable to be categorical. And if it had been a Likert survey with strongly disagree, agree, neutral, disagree, strongly disagree. That is categorical data, not continuous quantitative data. So that's why we were using a ruler so that our type here could be double. Uh, it's because we're storing an actual measured value, not just a number that represents a position on a scale. We're measuring the, the act of putting a tick, uh, ticking a line in drawing was a physical mechanism for which we were gathering a double type variable about our um, about our subject. So this would be like has cable. Does anyone have a categorical question that has three responses? I do. What was it? What's your question? How often do you play video games? Never. Um, Less than an hour a week, more than an hour a week. And that was, that was your slicer, right? Yes. Good. So this case, uh, so we would name the variable something like video game play frequency. Um, and so again, this is, we're all do, we're documenting what we're doing here in that quantitative variable profile. Um, let me just show you once again. 
what I'm doing here. So we want to, I'm designing this little project and the projects in 102 to help you think like a programmer. Um, so that's why we're being systematic. So we would say student response on strip survey, name of variable. So in this case, we would have an entire form uh, dedicated to each variable. So we name variables without spaces and weird characters. And that's important for being able to work nicely with the movement of data into and out of tools that might use spaces as delimiters. So our source, um, this would be your peers in DAT uh, 102 uh, fall 20 and then however many survey responses you collected so we're, we're, yep how many 19 yes 19 okay perfect um, now what I I should I'm gonna have to upgrade this form because what I also want um, I should have in here also is data type uh, in the most general sense so if it's video game frequency, what is the data type? What are we storing in? What did you store in your column? Did you store text or number or what? Letter? Character? Uh, character A, B, or C. Okay, cool. So the type could be a single character. So you could store that in eight bits of data. So character. And then it would be common um, if you have a only a range. You said A... B, C, D, like that? Just A, B, C. A, B, C, great. So you can kind of, if it's categorical, you can delimit, uh, you can list the possible values um, that would go in there. So that's excellent. Now, and what was your spectrum question? What is your opinion on violence in video games? Okay, and then you, that's right. So you had um, violent opinion, you might, did you, what could be a good name for that? Opinion about violence. And should we include about violence? I might include in games. In case you're aggregating this in a larger uh, set of variables. Getting more specific and making it longer is, um, is a fine balance. Um, opinion about violence in, we could do VG, we could abbreviate VG. Okay, and then you stored, uh, you did your measuring, so the type here would be a double. And um, then we can start doing the quantitative analysis. So. Uh, we would say that our focus tonight and for the next little while would be on univariate analysis for our spectrum question using a categorical variable that we encode or we store by using a character type field. And, um, but fundamentally, for the quanti continuous quantitative variable profile, um, we are interested in thinking about one, we'd say one variable about a single unit of analysis for which we have a, a set of samples. Um, so we're still in univariate analysis land. And the very first uh, mechanism that we use for univariate analysis with a continuous quantitative variable is a histogram. And a histogram allows us to visualize the data. We can see its shape. And uh, histograms can be designed uh, manually on a lot of tools, and now they're becoming so popular that you can generate them automatically, which we'll do. Uh, we'll see how um, Google Sheets can help us. So um, histograms include bins. So we'd say a bin in a histogram delimits an equal size, uh, an equal range of values that the variable can take on. So a histogram is always 
showing us how values are distributed with a single quantitative variable. Okay, so it's not it's not a bar chart, uh, and I'm doing such a miserable job at talking and drawing an Instagram. It's not a bar chart because a bar chart would be a multivariate tool in which we might include. So if we have did this, uh, you could have a bar chart on. Uh, if you did different courses and you group the surveys responses by which course you're in, you might say that you have a variable for each course's responses. So a bar chart is not what we're doing. The space between the bars on a bar chart is the difference between a bar chart and a histogram. In histogram, the bars are drawn with contiguous sides to convey that you are displaying the values over a continuous range and not an isolated set of um, isolated set of quantities that have a little bar sticking up. So each one of these is called a bin, and the bin size ranges. Uh, bin size allows us to see different patterns and granularity within the data itself. So one common way to think about a distribution that we'll play with in the course is grade distribution from the open course grading system. So um, as a quick demo of a histogram there, you can play with that data under point free grading, access read only drive of grades. And so a basic way to think about, well, if the variable is student grade point in one of my courses, um, you can see what I have here is not a histogram um, because the bars aren't, uh, aren't sharing a side. I thought I, uh, okay. So what I'd like us to try doing, let's do it in a, let's pull up your strip survey Google sheet and start a new uh, sheet in there. So strip surveys 102. And then I'm going to make, oh, how did I get into there? Okay. And then so go ahead and move into your directory and then jump up and say new uh, Google Sheet. If you haven't, I guess you probably already have your, most of you have your analysis in there. Um, so on the bottom, I want us to tinker with distributions uh, by making a um, an estimate an estimated distribution. So let's I'm gonna make a new sheet and let's name it um, hypotheses. And so um, Ryan, uh, can we use since we put yours up there? Could I? Uh, model with your data? Yeah, you can use my data. OK. OK, so we've got uh, our beautiful table there. So I'm going to copy this over and tinker with it. And so you may use, uh, you may decide to use the same structure that you used on your data and on your actual raw data responses for your hypothesis. So having a copy might be helpful. So we want to start envisioning how 
the slider amounts might be distributed across your class. Um, and so for now, let's see what the Google, so this is sample video games. Okay, there's my camel casing. Um, and so if you, I'm going to rename my field to be the name of the variable. So in general with our spreadsheets, we want the column names to be variable names that have no spaces and weird characters. So like we did together, this is going to be opinion uh, about VG violence. So if you haven't, uh, if you have spaces in your variable names, this is the time to get rid of them um, and never put them in again. They, sh they should never have a space in the actual name. You could have a translation, you could have a mapping of official variable names to um, human friendly names, um, but our, uh, our columns, uh, columns suggest a single variable and like we learned our rows suggest a record about a particular instance of our unit of analysis. And so when we're making a histogram in Google Sheets, we provide it a single variable's worth of value. And that variable's name traditionally is in, in the first row. Um, it's awfully nice to have it in the first row and not to use the first row as a, as a, um, as a title because exporting will by default use the first row as um, variable names. So we want to get in the habit of uh, regardless of where your spreadsheet skills are, we want them in this class to start converging on data analytics norms. So that's why we're doing some of this practice. Now, um, I'm gonna show you the easy way uh, to do it in here because Google Sheets now has histogram uh, built into it, but then I'm gonna make a pitch for tinkering with uh, making it manually. So you'll see it didn't do a very good job. Um, <laughs> at guessing and it's nice it's nice when google doesn't seem to know everything about how to do everything it somehow renews my faith in human value <laughs> or something um, about that so let's jump into edit chart and we're going to tell it that nope uh, we didn't want your suggested one uh, what we actually want is histogram um, called histogram chart and Google did a good job of showing us uh, something that doesn't look like a bar graph. And it knew very nicely that the column, the first, the value in row one of column C, which I selected, is the variable name. And we can see what we have on the y axis of a histogram uh, is not a measurement of intensity, it's not the student's response. It's how many students responded in the range of the x-axis ticks. So what's important is that the distance between the ticks is the same across your entire histogram so that we have a space, we, we maintain spatial fidelity across that axis. And you'll notice that it's a very standard, um, uh, it's standard to be able to adjust the bucket size. Okay, so they call it bucket, bins or buckets. So over here is where I want you to start tinkering because this is where it's quite exciting um, to see how the shape, our ability to see granularity in the data uh, is affected by how many bins. And there's usually a sweet spot given how many observations we have in, in all. Um, so if I say the bucket size is 10, well, all of the values, all of the responses lie between zero and 10. So a bucket size of 10 just gives us a single bar that is the end of the survey, um, which is not very useful, but it's a good place to start. And so as we increase bucket size, or in this case, as we decrease bucket size, increase bucket number, we can get uh, finer grained data. Um, it's not I wrong. Just noticed in my in my data set it it looked at the it didn't format the 0 0.20 numbers or like the zero point responses as actual numbers 
Oh, so there's actually four response. There's actually three data responses in the zero bucket. Oh, interesting. Uh, as I think in there's that, like in format cell or something, you can change it to number. Yeah, and so this is not um, uh, zero, thirteen, and D. Okay. Yep, number. I want it to be number. Good. It adjusted. Perfect. Um, so that's that's nifty. So you can see with um, the histogram, when I use bucket sizes of one, I am seeing more resolution, meaning uh, there are more pieces of visual information. There's more bars of different heights. Um, but it also has the effect because the bins, the, the survey response number is small enough that I have some bins without any responses. So visually, I lose the moundness uh, of the data. So it's, there's, a, there's no magic number of bins. What you're trying to do is convey a, uh, a shape of the data to the eye, and there's no official optimal amount of, uh, uh, of granularity to, to actually use. So I think that having a bin size that it chose, uh, so we go to customize, histogram has its own area because histograms are the only uh, chart in here that have buckets. So the bucket size of two, meaning two, um, now did you scale these already as a percent of bar length? I actually had the bar be 10 long, so uh, that's just the direct uh, measurement. <laughs> very, very clever. Um, so these are both, these can be considered both raw measurements as well as a, um, a, a percent. If we, if we um, multiply by 10, we get a percent of total bar. Um, so when we have a, a bucket size of two, we get the classic mound um, without any breaks. And um, this pattern of data, this particular distribution in which the values are clustered around a center and have tails that slope down parabolic invert in, as, an, uh, as a component of a parabola, parabolic tails is a fantastically uh, interesting mathematical phenomena. And this function that represents the ideal mound is used extensively throughout statistics in order to carry out various inferences because this mound has shape uh, properties that reflect a startling array of uh, human measured human endeavors. Um, survey responses, we're seeing one of them pop up and we'll see them pop up more and more throughout the class. And so finding a histogram, a mound-like shape of data is a relief to statisticians because one of the um, underlying assumptions that's often made in order to conduct uh, basic statistical analysis with confidence intervals um, is that the data is mound shaped and we can deal with a lot of variability in how any particular mound looks and we can still call it mound like um, an important component is that there's there's one center and uh, it's not bimodal. It doesn't have little upticks on any of the sides. So Ryan's data that we pulled up is, is absolutely mound shaped. The mounds do not have to be symmetrical to go ahead and call the, the responses distributed normally. Um, a normal curve is another name for the mound shaped shape or the, the bell shape is another way that people describe it. Um, so a histogram allows us to see our shape from a count in range perspective. And that's a, a useful beginning tool. And then our other tool that we use for univariate is what we started digging into last week, which is our what? Box and whisker plot. Our box and whisker plot. Again, uh, one box and whisker plot is showing us values of a single variable uh, gathered about a subject. 
and our middle line in the bar chart is represents which measure of center? Median. Yep. And so it's our middle value. And the box itself, uh, our scale, here's our scale. The box itself uh, encompasses what fraction of all the observations? 50%. Yep, the middle 50%. So the box is your middle 50. And then what can't, what can't we see on, on this box and whisker chart? We computed this at the end of last class. We have the, the rule for when does, a, when does a piece of information qualify as an outlier worthy of more investigation? What did we call that invisible value on either side? That's a threshold for outliers. The fences? Yeah, the upper and lower, sometimes called left and right fences, um, which I'm going to adjust my box size, which is basically one and it's not basically mathematically defined as one and a half the box width from the, the first and fourth quartiles. So if I make a smaller looking box, um, Hold on one sec. So our whiskers, this box is, we'll make it six. If it's six inches wide or 60, uh, 60 units wide. So we'll say from uh, 18 to 24, our left whisker is one and a half the box size, so it's going to be nine this way. So our whisker would be at nine. And uh, uh, in, on the other side, we add 9 to 24, and we get 33. And so our whiskers, by definition, are what? The lower or upper quarter of the data? Negative. The whisker extends to the... It's a line that extends the lowest value inside fence. The minimum and the maximum, right? Uh, no, the lowest value inside the fence. Um, the so min the and fence max, the minimum? It may be the min and max if all of your values lie above the fence. But your min and max could be outliers that are on the far oh, side okay. of the fence. Um, okay. And so uh, that's a common misconception with a box and whisker chart because min and maxes uh, are useful to understand but graphically they often um, they're often uh, they can be distracting from the box and whisker chart that's trying to convey where the the gist of the data are and then which pieces of data are uh, so unusual that we're going to make them its own symbol in the chart um, so thank you for uh, proposing that so that a bit about I used to think that they were min and max myself, so good work. Um, so then this would be our highest value. Okay, and so the tool um, for making these that I'm going to suggest for us will allow us to compare across the entire class um, because we are going to make Boston Whisker charts that graphically use the same number of pixels. And so let me show you where this goes. Um, a quick question. Yes. On on the box plot, mm -hmm. just because I I had this written down from last week, values that are outside the whiskers is that when it becomes an outlier? Does it have to be outside the fence? The fence comes before the whisker. You can't have a whisker without a fence. So, no, I mean like like if it was 
Oh, yeah, never mind. You're right. I, I just realized my mistake. Okay. Thanks for asking. Yeah, no problem. Um, so if we look at uh, last year's, this is, this is where we're going to go tonight. Uh, hopefully that's really cool. So here's our lovely uh, outputs from uh, your peers a uh, semester ago. So this was my original example before I decided to uh, work with Ryan. Um, so do you have a cable subscription? There's the slicer. And so what uh, I've invited, what I'll invite you to do is use our box and whisker tool to first make a single box and whisker chart showing the value of your spectrum question, I mean the variable representing the responses to your spectrum question uh, in aggregate across all the students, regardless of their opinion on uh, the slicer. So how important it is, is it for you to follow local news? Left is not important at all, no middle label, and right is very important. Um, and guess what? <laughs> Uh, turns out when you ask people questions like that, um, you get very similar looking uh, data across all sorts of uh, domains, which is a center roughly in the middle <laughs> of the possible spectrum. Uh, and some folks uh, kind of symmetrically distri get distributed on, uh, on either side. So we can see in this case, our whiskers uh, if this is not a, a very symmetrical distribution, but our center is in the middle. Um, and you can see uh, when we break it down and make sub variables, we might say, so this is only the respondents that answered yes, and we have an N of seven. So the class was nicely distributed almost in half. Um, who was it the other week that mentioned how important it is to know the N before we compare box and whisker charts? That's Scott, are you out there? Yep, I'm out here, it was me. Ah, great, so um, once again, uh, we'll do this analysis tonight and it's important to have that end in mind and um, it might actually be nice to put it in the label for the, the box and whisker chart. And so once we slice the class down, we have uh, two new variables that we can make a box plot of each and when we stack them with the same scale on the bottom and uh, when we, if we position them on the page like this, we can start uh, comparing perspectives. Uh, so yes, people that have cable were, had a median that was almost 20% higher than those that said, no, I do not have cable subscription. Um, and notably, we had this uh, squishedness of uh, the upper end on those that don't have cable. Uh, not a lot of folks that don't have cable are in the high importance on local news. So this is a very useful analytic tool. And the way we're going to generate these is linked on, you got it, the schedule. Uh, I searched far and wide uh, for a tool. Um, StatKey has a very nice uh, box plot builder, but the problem is you can't um, you can't dictate the scale, and so we couldn't compare uh, across surveys, and the scale would get wonky, and the image wouldn't transfer right. So this was uh, this solution is based on uh, actually using R on the back end, and so. My quantitative variable profile allows you, once you finish those, to generate the box plots very quickly. Um, so we're gonna build, you're gonna have actually three of these. You'll have the quantitative variable profile for um, the aggregate response to your spectrum question. And then the name of your sub variable is, you could prefix it with sliced. So you're, uh, Ryan will still be uh, the variable type and unit of analysis will still be the same, but rather we have a subset of our original. So sliced, we could say sliced by, um, in our case, uh, you could say, what were your labels again, Ryan? Um, the, for the slicer? Uh-huh. Never. 
less than an hour a week, more than an hour a week. Okay, so you could he could come up with a variable schema that looks like sliced by and then the response and then um, v, so maybe you could abbreviate that VGPF. Okay, so um, following a nice pattern in variable naming like this is awfully handy when you're sorting a list of 100 variables that you have about a particular uh, unit and they get grouped nicely. So what Ryan's gonna do, I was just doing that to um, make them all grouped together, but Ryan will make, he's actually gonna need four. And don't get overwhelmed, you don't have to, we're not, necessarily hand computing all of the boxes in here, just the key ones for our box plot. So he would come in here and say, this will be, oh, I copied all of them. So we can just delete like that. So this is the uh, greater than one hour. This is less than one hour. And this is never. Um, and once again, um, it, one option, this is starting to feel a little bit clumsy now that I'm actually doing it. Um, I definitely wanted to do it for the aggregate, but, uh, maybe it might make more sense to just make a tabular version in your analytics spreadsheet, uh, that looks something like, um, variable and then kind of transposing our box and whisker chart inputs to the columns in a little mini table. So we'd say, um, so if we look at our tool, it follows almost exactly So variable, we might say title. So it might help to actually make the values exactly like they are in the generator um, in Q1, median, Q3, max. And now this is where, uh, this is the important part is, this is where you get to design the, the scaling used for the images. And so we want to norm across the class so that our box plots um, are translatable. They have a reference to one another. And so did I put this in our, did I quantify exactly what the, Oh, I did it in the in the analysis sheet, I think at the top. Yeah, okay, so generate your three chart images using the IMS tool. Be sure to scale your data so the min value on all the plots is zero and the max is 1,000. Um, now, I'm gonna have us do that. Did we get... Okay, so I did abandon it. There was a, I had a lovely, a lovely vision uh, that used meter long uh, rulers and I have several hundred clamps and I was gonna build this big wall of uh, box plots by sliding clamps along rulers, um, but that is no more. So as long as we wanna make sure that everyone is scaling from zero to a hundred on the generator so that the scales line up. And where did you go, generator? So we would say, um, it's just, I'm gonna make up a little data, 
So, but your overall min will all be, everyone will be zero and everyone will be a hundred and we're all going to put 10. And then this is where uh, your axis title would be the, uh, this would be like violence. Uh, so put your variable name down there. Um, and for the image size, let's use the defaults. Let's keep 550 and 200. And so then it generates a nice uh, savable image. Um, and that's scaled, uh, scaled beautifully. Now notice, um, in this case, the min and the max are not we're not entering the minimum value, we are entering, it should say, the left whisker. So that's important to remember, is that, thanks for that translation, the official official box plots, because um, there's no official box plot, but the, the mathematically responsive box plot, this is left whisker and this is right whisker. So in our spreadsheet, we would have um, quantitatively, we'll have a value that doesn't make it over to the box plot, right? From our, if you were doing it on, um, if you were transferring what it is from here. Oh, this is what we did last week, that's perfect. Um, so we do put min and max in our profile. So you're gonna have to translate your uh, is your upper fence, lower fence? Wait, is there not a whisker on here? I want to check. Did I really not put whisker on? Lower outlier whiskers. Okay, so I didn't, I didn't, this is a, version one is, whatever the, whatever version this is, version one is no good. <laughs> it should have a whisker in there um, for making the box spot, because I definitely have that listed and we have that as part. So we would have whisker would be right in between these two. So we have to add that. You're welcome to add it. Just insert row below, row above to left whisker. So lowest, once again, lowest value inside, uh, let's say lowest value to the right of lower fence. How about the smallest? Smallest value to the right of lower fence and right whisker. Good, I think that's right. 